Hello, welcome back to Animated Literacy. This is part 13 of the overview and research for the program. In our last two sections, I demonstrated how to use drawing and labeling to teach children how to connect sounds to letters, how to print those letters, and how to read and write those words. As we were doing that process, I would draw one step at a time, and as I drew, the children would hold up their pen in their ready position and watch. As soon as I completed a part of the drawing, then they would draw that part on their paper, then put their hand back up in their ready position and watch as I drew. So we would take turns with that. So I was directly teaching children how to copy in order to move forward in their reading and writing instruction. Copying has been a source of controversy over the years in early childhood education. There are some who have said, never let children copy, do not model for them, simply put out materials and let children explore. And certainly that's a positive thing to do, to set out materials and, and let children investigate and explore them. However, if it's the only thing you do, children may not progress very fast or very far. I received my new issue of Banjo Newsletter this morning and in it was an interview with Banjo Ben Clark. And in the interview, he was telling about his early days of trying to learn to play the banjo. He heard the banjo and wanted to play it, but he had no idea how to play it and he had no one to copy. Then he discovered that his uncle had a banjo and some finger picks and they were given to him. And he took out the finger picks and he put them on his fingers like this, which you might do for old time banjo, but not for blue time grass banjo. So he tried to play like that and the picks kept coming off. So he was really excited when he got to go to a festival and he heard a banjo player that he liked a lot. So he got to go backstage and meet the banjo player and the first thing he asked him was, how do you keep the picks on your fingers? Well, the banjo player said, show me your hand and he showed him how he was wearing the picks. And he was told, no, you turn the picks around and you wear them like this. You have them on your fingers backwards. About 12 years later, he was playing for a festival and staying at a hotel where the performers played, and he ran into this same banjo player. And it turned out the banjo player's name was J.D. Crow, one of the best banjo players ever. And he asked if he remembered the question. He said, yeah, I, I remember when you asked that. What are you doing now? And he says, well, I'm playing backup for Taylor Swift, and, and I'm playing banjo and guitar and dobro, mandolin and piano. So, well, the advice must have worked. So it's possible that Ben Clark might have figured that out on his own, but it certainly would have taken him more time. And at best, it would have slowed down his development. So if we have someone to copy, it definitely speeds up our progress. When I was first learning to play bluegrass banjo, fortunately, I was told the only way to do it is to copy Earl Scruggs. And everybody who starts out on bluegrass banjo and becomes good, starts out by playing Cripple Creek exactly the way Earl Scruggs played it, then advances on to other tunes. And I'm still practicing learning how to copy Earl Scruggs. Chris Pandolfi is a banjo player who plays for the infamous String Dusters, and I went to a workshop with him, and he told this story. He didn't start out copying Earl Scruggs. Instead, he copied Bela Fleck, who, who copied Earl Scruggs, but that then went on to much more modern styles of playing the banjo. Then Chris Pandolfi went to Berklee School of Music and graduated, went to Nashville to start his career as a professional banjo player. At a jam session, he met Ben Eldridge. Ben Eldridge was the banjo player for Seldom Seen. Um, he listened to Chris Pandolfi play and he said, you've got it wrong. You have to go back and learn from Earl Scruggs. You have to have the fundamentals. So that's exactly what he did. He spent about two years going back after graduated from Berkeley, learned how to copy Earl Scruggs and went on to become one of the best banjo players out there. So copying is a major part of many of the things we do. Mona Brooks techniques are the techniques that I use for teaching children how to draw and she's been criticized for teaching children to copy. She tells us that Picasso Mike, and Michelangelo both copied other artists' work for at least two years as a part of their training. When Picasso began to express himself in what were considered unique styles, he was actually copying many of the images from African masks. 
dancers copy other dancers, musicians copy other musicians, athletes copy other athletes. It's one of the first things that we do if we want to become proficient at something is most people try to find somebody who does it well and then copies them. If you're learning a trade, you might serve an apprenticeship where you copy the masters that come before you. And if you can't copy, you're probably not going to be very employable. We talked about Vygotsky and his way of scaffolding so that we can start instruction way up here and then gradually scaffold children until they reach that level. And his basic premise was what you can do with assistance today, you can do independently tomorrow. And his first way of assisting was copying. So copying is a major part of animated literacy. Keith Stanovich says that as if we are arguing about something, it's simply because we don't have enough research, because what researchers look for is convergence and consensus. Well, the arguments about copying continued to progress until there was a discovery that I believe is one of the, the most important discoveries in child growth and development, and that it should end any kind of disagreement about copying. Mirror neurons were first discovered in Italy by two research assistants who were studying monkeys to find out which neurons in the brain fire when the monkey reaches out to grasp an object. So they would strap the monkeys into a chair and hook up electrodes to the neurons in their brain and then connect those electrodes to a computer. So if the specific neuron that was connected to the electrode fired, the computer would do a chirp. So it would go chirp. Well, one day they were working with the monkeys and they had got the, figured out pretty much which neurons fire when the monkeys grasp an object. But they left them connected while they went out and picked up some lunch. They brought the lunch back with them. Then they reached out and they picked out, up a piece of food and the computer went chirp. But when they looked, the monkeys had not moved. Yet the same neurons fired in the monkey's brain when the researcher picked it up as if the monkey had picked it up. So they tried picking up different things and they found that there was intention involved. If they picked up something the monkeys wanted, the neurons fired. If the monkey wasn't interested in what the researcher picked up, there was no firing. They, in uh, the year 2000, they went to a lecture and Dr. Ramachandran was attending the lecture. And Dr. Ramachandran is a researcher, brain researcher at UCSD in San Diego. And he had become most famous for being the first to amputate a phantom limb. Sometimes after people have lost an arm or a leg, they continue to experience pain in that phantom limb or the limb that's missing. Well, he figured out if you set up a mirror and you show the left arm in the mirror that, and the right arm is missing, the brain can be tricked into thinking that the left arm is the right arm and you can gradually massage it you can give exercise to stretch the left arm and the brain is tricked into thinking that you're massaging and exercising the right arm and gradually the pain would disappear but if you're missing both arms you can't use that technique so when he heard the researchers talk about that watching someone else is like doing it yourself he thought well maybe I could massage someone else's arm and cause the pain to go away but he didn't stop there he went on to studying mirror neurons in young children and this is a quote on mirror neurons that comes from the body has a mind of its own and it tells us newborns do not talk but their mirror neurons kick in within minutes of birth if you stick out your tongue at a newborn infant he may stick out his tongue at, back at you. Um, Andrew Meltzoff kind of stumbled into mirror neurons before he knew what they were back in the 1980s. He did an experiment to find out what children know and are capable of doing at birth. And this was at a time when it was thought that babies were born as empty vessels or blank slates. So what he did for his research is he went to various in individuals and he asked adults to make the silliest face they could make. And he photographed each adult making a silly face. Then he got permission to test infants as soon as they were born. And so he would bring them into his laboratory shortly after birth. The youngest that he tested was 42 minutes old. He would prop up the infant and he would show each infant a different picture of an adult making a silly face and then he would photograph the 
the infant looking at the face. Then he mixed up all these faces, handed them to various individuals and said, can you match the face of the baby to the, one you th to the adult face you think they were looking at? And people could. So these infants who had never looked in a mirror before, had never seen their own face, were capable of imitating adults making a silly face. Pretty impressive stuff. Well, he didn't know why. Well, it's because the neurons in your brain are there to enable you to copy and they kick in right after birth. As Dr. Ramachandran began studying this, what he discovered was that anytime you watch someone doing something, the neurons in your brain that you would use to do the same thing become active. It's as if you yourself were doing it. And then he goes on to give an example. If you watch someone, if you see a person being poked by a needle, your pain neurons fire away as though you were the one that was being poked. This same phenomenon happens with yawns. We're told yawns are, are contagious. Someone yawns and it's quite likely that you might yawn. Um, the circus has used this for a long time with sword swallowers and people um, poking needles through their body and so forth. That it tends to make us very uncomfortable and um, my neuron, mirror neurons are extremely active so I can't watch some of those performances. Dr. Ramachandran goes on to say you can make two columns side by side, one for the known characteristics of mirror neurons and one for the clinical symptoms of autism, and there is almost a precise match. So what he has observed is that autistic children or children with autism tend not to copy. And it's now believed that we learn to understand other people's feelings and emotions by copying their movements. So it's through mirror neurons that we learn how another individual is feeling. And so that's where empathy comes from. We also learn a lot of language by copying other people's gestures because gestures are the first language that children use and gestures are processed in the same area of the brain as speech. So when a deaf person is using sign language, they're activating the same language centers of the brain as when a person is speaking. But you can't speak as a baby, but you can gesture. So this is how babies start to develop their language centers even before they're capable of speech. But it's important to keep in mind that not everyone shows the same degree of mirroring. And study after study has shown that if you have a, a, one group of children that is actively engaged with their muscles and manipulating objects and building with blocks and, and learning through the use of their muscles, and then you have another group that is of babies that is simply watching this group. The group that learns is the group that's actually participating and using their muscles. The children that are watching don't benefit very much from that. So in the book, The Naked Brain by Richard Restack, he tells us not everyone shows the same degree of mirroring. When observing someone playing the piano, skilled pianists show stronger motor activation than the musically naive. So if you have played piano for years, and you're an expert pianist, and you go to a concert with uh, another expert pianist, as they're playing the piano, the same neurons will fire in your brain watching and listening as the person who is doing the playing. The same is true for athletes. If you have played football and you have caught a, a touchdown pass and you go to a football game and you watch someone else catch a touchdown pass, your brain will behave as though you were the one who caught it. And you'll have that same excitement. So this is why we spend so much money going to sporting events. But people who have never played that sport or any similar sport won't have that same degree of activation of the mirror neurons and will not enjoy it nearly as much. So this only works for people who have developed their system of mirror neurons by moving. He also tells us in The Naked Brain that at 18 months, an infant will imitate an action made by a human but fail to imitate an action made by a robot. This holds true for sounds. Infants older than nine months can learn new speech sounds only if the new sounds come from a real person. And so we've talked about the natural learning environment, that children learn best looking into human faces and copying people. 
So the technologies that have been created are not very helpful when learning language. Children need to learn it from an adult so they can watch the adult's mouth and see how they form sounds and hear those sounds coming from an actual adult. Also in the naked brain, Martin, um, we, it, we're told from Martin Lindstrom that when we read a book, these specialized mirror neurons respond as if we were actually doing what the character is doing. So a lot of our reading comprehension comes through mirror neurons. If you've been to the beach and you felt the sand under your toes and you have made a sand castle and now you read a story about somebody going and walking on the beach and feeling the sand and building a sand castle, the same neurons will fire in your brain as you're reading about it as originally fired when you had that experience. But if you've never had that experience, your mirror neurons will not be nearly as active and you'll have a much more difficult time comprehending that story. Martin Lindstrom, in his book, Biology, tells us that what buyers beware because the future of advertising isn't about smoke and mirrors, it's mirror neurons. And what advertising agencies are now doing is they're trying to activate your mirror neurons. So we see this in commercials about drugs where they, while they're listing all these horrible side effects of the drug, they're showing you this positive relationship with people and, and things that you have experienced. And so they're trying to convince you that if you take this drug, you'll re-experience all those wonderful positive things that you may want to go back to. When your gestures go away that came from near, or when you start to speak, your mirror neurons and the gestures don't lose their importance. Vygotsky tells us that labeling is the primary function of speech used by young children. But when your children are labeling things, they're simultaneously embellishing their first words with very expressive gestures. So even after children start to speak, those gestures remain very important. We also know from research I've presented before that Fluency primarily comes from rereading. So in the early stages, we want children to read, write, and reread all of these labels that they're learning to draw. So a really powerful tool that I make in my classroom is a book like this for each child in the classroom so that they don't just have to draw with me, but they can draw independently on their own. In the back of, of the learn draw to read and write book. There are pages like this that directly teach children how to draw and label 150 different objects. And so what I do for the book is in the front of the book, I copy the charts of all of those different objects. Then following that, I make a copy of all the pages that show how to draw things. Then in our next two sessions, we're going to learn how to find adjectives in books that we can use to describe those drawings and how to find verbs that we can use to label how those parts of the object can move. So now, when children are finished with their work, they can either choose to go to the library and take out a book or they can choose to get out this book and simply open it up to whatever they want to draw. And if I've already taught them how to draw it, they can review it. If I haven't taught it, they can go ahead and, and attempt to draw it on their own. Then after they finish doing their drawing, then they label the picture, then they label the parts of the picture, then they put in adjectives to describe those parts, then they can put in verbs to name how those parts can move, and then they can write a sentence or a story about their picture. So this can be done over and over and over again during their free time. It can also be used at a center. This is also a really valuable tool when you have to be out of the room for a substitute. Um, if you're like me, planning for a substitute wasn't my favorite thing to do. So I always put in my substitute plans about a 20 minute period once the children had enough skills where the substitute could simply pass out this book and each child can choose whatever it is that they want to draw and then they can label it and then write about it. 
there are times when sometimes the principal or somebody comes in the room and says, we need you to come up to the office and here's someone to watch your class. And you're, then you're going, so what do I have my kids do while I'm gone, especially if you're in the primary grades? Well, you can simply say to the person watching your class, pass out these books and have the children choose something to draw and label. So this becomes a really valuable tool and you can make, if you're homeschooling your children or you're reinforcing what the school is doing at home, it's also real powerful to have this kind of a tool at home for your children to work with. So in our next session, we're, we are going to advance beyond single words when we're labeling the picture and the parts of the picture and we're going to start bringing in adjectives to describe those parts and then in the next section we're going to start bringing in verbs to label how those parts can move. So thank you again for joining me and I'll look forward to seeing you in the next section.